All righty, welcome to Bungalows for Bachelors number 13. Today we are going to talk about foundations, the beginning of the construction portion of this lesson journey. And we are going to jump right in. I will share my screen and we will start talking about it. So we are now in phase three, building enclosure. In this phase, we are going to be building up out of the ground to a point where we have a dried in building that is ready to start putting things inside. This is basically the portion that's going to make the house look like it's on your property. So what are the basic types of foundations to build your house with? Well, the first one that I am most familiar with, that is the most common in the south part of the United States, is the slab on grade. This can also be called a slab. It can be called a concrete slab. This is the thing that is concrete poured directly on the soil with nothing below it but dirt or base or or special um, compaction and, and things like that there's no there's no gaps there's no air there's no room for anything below this it's just a, just a bunch of concrete there's two types of ways to reinforce the concrete of course you can't just pour the concrete by itself if it cracks it'll just fall to pieces well when it cracks it'll fall to piece pieces and you don't want that so the first way is just traditional rebar this method is basically just putting, if you've never seen rebar before, it is just steel bars that have ridges along them and the ridges help the rebar hold onto the concrete. And you place all these bars at different sizes in different places and it allows the concrete to have tensile strength. So when, it's, when the beams are being stressed and flexed under different loads and the house, uh, dirt underneath the house moves around different ways, the foundation can hold that, hold that weight by uh, having this steel reinforcement in there. Now, the rebar is just put in there. They're just chunks of thick, big bars, and they are tied together, and they overlap each other when the, you know one runs into another one. So that is the, the traditional rebar way. That is everything's just kind of placed in there, tied together, and you pour concrete on it. The other type of a slab is a post-tension slab. Now, this oftentimes has rebar in it somewhere in a few places, but most of the slab strength is derived from uh, these tendons that are placed in the slab. And these tendons are placed after afterwards. So when they're forming the slab, instead of putting rebar down, they're going to put these hollow tubes down where they can pass a cable through later. Um, so it's kind of, it's much faster because there's usually less of them than there would be rebar. Um, but they put all these tendons in there uh, they, well, they don't put the tendons in. They put the tubes in, and then they pour all the concrete, and then they put the ten. They put these cables called tendons through the tubes, and they tension them, and then release the tension into the slab, and it basically squeezes the whole slab together, and that acts as the tension reinforcement part of the concrete, instead of the the rebar. So that's a that's a post tension type. Another type is a pier and beam foundation. This is a very different. This can frequently have a concrete perimeter beam on the outside or a CMU block wall perimeter beam on the outside. Um, just two different ways to combine materials to make the perimeter a little stronger. Uh, old houses didn't have that concrete on the outside. Sometimes they would lay brick straight onto gravel or stuff like that. It was quite weak and it did break and houses were not very stable with the old methods. And occasionally they would just have wood on the outside too and just had put a lattice or something on the outside. So that is, uh, it's not a very stable way to build a house on an unstable soil because you are effectively trying to build a, a boat on soil out of putting a bunch of individual life buoys. If you took a bunch of buoys and tied them all together, that, that would be how the stiffness of the boat compared to taking an actual boat that has a, a frame and saw one solid structure and then placing that in the water, it's going to float very differently than a bunch of buoys tied together. So pier and beam foundations are not very stable on unstable soil for that reason. Now, if you have stable soil or rock, it's less of a big deal. So not something to worry about, but something to think about. But a pier and beam is shown at the top right here where there are piers or posts holding up beams and each post spreads its load out on a footing and it's mostly a wood framed floor as a foundation. 
A basement is basically the same thing as a pier and beam or a crawl space foundation. It's just taller. And usually the because it's taller and it's got more going on, the walls on the perimeter are going to be made out of concrete or some kind of CMU block or something structural like that since it's much taller. It's going to be handling a little bit more soil pressure and potentially dealing with more weight. So basement walls are going to be something like that. And they're going to be sometimes up to a normal eight feet, but usually a basement ceiling is a little bit shorter um, just to save a little bit of money because there's a lot of excavation involved. But that is the third type of foundation is the basement. So why would you use a slab? Well, so there's sort of lots of reasons, but um, summarizing some of the reasons would be that it is the strongest foundation for the cost of what you're doing. A slab can be a little bit more expensive than some of the other versions, but you are going to be able to have a much stronger foundation for your house uh, because of the thing I mentioned before. If you're, if every, you know, 10 or 15 feet, there's a concrete with steel beam holding the floor to be rigid in both directions, all the way through your house, you built a big strong boat and you're just going to use that to ride the soil. Now, if you don't, then like with a pier and beam, then you do not have the same stiffness. You do not have the same strength. So you might be able to save money if you don't do a slab, but your house is not going to, you're going to see more sheetrock cracks and things like that if you're not on really solid soil. So another good reason to get a slab is you're going to get the stiffest and quietest floor. There is, your floor is literally concrete and it's not going to creak. It's not going to move. It's, it's pretty immovable. So if, you, if you're not screwing or nailing wood down, then there's nothing, there's no reason for your floor to creak. So that's the uh, good perk of a slab. If there are flooding concerns, like you have a high water table or something, it's going to be kind of a bad idea to make a crawl space or a basement and dig down into the soil unless you have really good waterproofing measures. It's just not a good idea to, to do that. So most time people are like that are going to build a slab because slabs don't flood. I mean, they do if the house can flood if the house is low enough compared to a flood level. But when you build the house up out of the ground on the slab, water being in the ground is not going to matter. Another good reason to do the slab is that there's no cost to insulate the floor. The floor is in contact with the dirt. And the dirt is not necessarily cold or warm like the way you'd want it to be, but it's going to lose a lot less, you're going to lose a lot less heat uh, or gain a lot less heat through the soil. Like if when it's hot in the summer, you're not gaining heat in your house through the soil, really. And when it's cold in the winter, you're not really losing a lot of heat to the soil. You might lose a little bit more in the winter, but there's not a huge deal there. Now, some fancy building science houses are starting to insulate slabs. They will either pour the slab and then put insulation down and then put a wood floor on top of that, or they will actually put insulation below the concrete um, in formwork and stuff like that. Just kind of a few different ways to do it. But um, you don't want to naturally put that below your beams because that would crush the insulation. But for the most part, people don't insulate slabs. So you're not going to pay for all that. When you build a wood floor system over a crawl space or a basement, you have to insulate that floor because wood is going, the heat's going to pass right through that. So that's what the insulation's for. Now, when you're boot, when you're doing a slab, why would you do rebar or why would you do post tension? Well, rebar is 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 has default strength. When it exists in the concrete, it's adding tensile strength to the concrete. It also can add some compressive strength to the concrete too. Now, a post tension can fail in tension if the tendon fails, gets old, stretches out, things like that. When a tendon fails, the concrete no longer has tensile strength. So it can move way more or have more problems when those tendons are, are bad. And sometimes you don't always know that that's the case. So rebar has a benefit in that. It's, it's always, if the concrete, if the rebar is in there, the concrete's got tensile strength. A uh, benefit of post-tension is that it can hide expansion cracks better. Sorry, well, the expansion cracks are, the, the, the cracks themselves expand when a concrete foundation cures because the concrete is shrinking as it cures, and that's what develops the cracks. So as the concrete shrinks, develops cracks, the post-tension is going to squeeze everything together uh, that in a way that rebar can't do, 
and it's going to hide those cracks a little better. So that if you have a garage floor or an exposed concrete floor or something, it's going to hide that a little bit better. And post tension is generally less expensive to build than rebar. It's a little bit faster and a little bit less expensive on the material. So it is, it's usually the choice for tract home builders who are looking to build houses that are just strong enough, but as affordable as possible to sell the most and to get the most people in homes. So um, that's just the, the way it goes. So why would you want a pier and beam foundation? Well, the, a benefit of a pier and beam foundation is that it, de depending on your situation, if you, for example, have a cut and fill lot and you have a retaining wall below your lot and you want to remove some of the weight that is bearing on that retaining wall, then if you dig out some of the dirt that exists there and build a crawl space, that can be a benefit. Um, but in, in most cases, that's not necessarily helpful. So what other reasons are there? Well, you can break down pier and beam foundation work into much, much smaller bite-sized pieces. A slab on grade takes a lot of heavy equipment, a lot of heavy moving stuff. It takes trenching. It takes, you know, not that a, a pier and beam doesn't, but it requires a lot more movement of a lot more heavy materials to put that thing together. And you're handling a lot of concrete all at once to, to finish off and, and pour for, to make this massive slab. So a pier and beam is less complicated. Maybe you're pouring a strip footing that's continuous all the way around the perimeter and everything in the middle is just block, is just uh, individual footings. You know, it can be a lot simpler to pour the concrete for that. And it's not as intimidating. So it can be the choice for a lot more DIY people potentially for that reason. Uh, though I don't necessarily think that's a good reason to choose it, but it can be broken down. So another benefit is that you get permanent access to subfloor utilities. So all your plumbing, all your pipes, all your HVAC that's put in the crawl space is accessible for the most part, unless you kind of have a poor design that makes it hard to get to. You don't have that luxury when you do a slab on grade. If you bury your plumbing and your conduits in the ground, they are there. And usually there's a problem at some point along the life, unless you have extremely stable soil and a very well built system that's that can kind of float around and have, have good movement. So access to those utilities is nice if you ever need to work on anything or fix something or unclog something. Um, some reasons why people do choose a pier and beam is concrete floor can be too stiff for joints for older people and it can be less forgiving on falls. It is extremely, extremely stiff which is why it doesn't make any noise, but it also is so stiff to the point that it can be uncomfortable. A wood floor is naturally going to flex more under your weight and your feet, and it's going to be easier on your joints. It's not gonna be such a harsh impact when you're walking around the house, especially if you fall on a wood floor, it's going to flex the floor instead of flexing your bones. So it's a, it's a good reason for elderly people sometimes, and I've seen that be a reason to select it. And where the climate is more moderate and you want to rely on natural aspiration of the house, letting fresh air through your house, that can keep your heating and cooling costs a little bit lower um, to have to be able to let air pass below your floor, not just through your house, but letting the, the floor space vent as well. I've seen that be uh, a choice for um, before HVAC was around houses in hotter climates would have, they would want crawl spaces so that they could let the air pass below the floor and let the house have lots of fresh air venting through it and keep it less hot. So that can be a, a choice depending on your climate. So why would you want a basement? Well, you get all the same benefits pretty much as having a crawl space, but you get more height. And that allows you the potential living space to put things down there, store things, walk around down there, finish it out, have extra rooms, uh, put the drum set, stuff like that. So a basement is a little more expensive because you're gonna you're gonna be investing in some a little bit tougher materials, and uh, of course more of the materials because you're going taller. But um, that is one reason. Another reason would be to take advantage of the steep slopes that you have on your site. If you have really steep slopes and you build a slab, or you build a house that's all in one level, then one side of the slab is going to be short. The other side of the slab is going to be really really tall. I have seen slab foundations that have 13, 15 foot faces on the tall side because they wanted the house to be flat. Well, they paid a lot of money for that foundation, I guarantee it. 
Pouring walls like that is not easy. So if you have a steep slope and you step your foundation down, usually that ends up with a basement style house. So that is one reason why a basement might happen. And it ends up being less expensive to build a foundation like that. And the other benefit of a basement is that, of course, you have safety from windstorms, tornadoes. If you're in an area where that's a problem and you need to get down below where flying things would fly, that's a great way to be safe from those things. So we're talking a little bit about slab foundation process here. So we'll jump right in. The first step is you need an engineered foundation design for the most part, unless you're building like a shed or something super simple in your backyard and you're not really concerned with like there's gonna be no sheetrock, so it can flex. There's gonna be no problems there. I mean, you're not concerned with a ton. You just you just want a simple slab. For most houses, you want an engineered foundation design so that you can tell where exactly should my beams go, how deep should they be, what's the steel that's going to be in the beams, what's the steel that's going to be in the mat, where where do all these connections go? Do I need special things going on? If I do, I have a big drop in my foundation with a special detail I need from an engineer. You know what's going on there. So you want an engineered foundation design. And once you have that then you're kind of good to go. And that's going to come from the architectural design. You're going to give that to the engineers and they're going to give you the foundation design. And then you have all the specs you need for how to build it. So the first thing you're going to do on your property is you're going to lay out the, the foundation design. You're going to say, what's my perimeter? Where are my beams going? Uh, things like that. And you're going to do that with string lines and stakes and form, uh, not form boards and bat, batter boards and things like that to establish the shape of your house in the dirt. Once you have layout done, then you're going to, this. these things can be moved around and changed, but this is somewhat of a standard format. Um, you're going to place the exterior forms, which can either be built up out of lumber, or you can build them out of panel forms, which are basically stud, stud two by fours cut up into different sizes, nailed to plywood sheets that allow you to basically have a really tall panel. And these panels are just kind of stepped and adjust, adjusted. So you end up, you end up not necessarily building formwork up to the finished floor level it can go past it and then when you're pouring you just keep in mind that there's a finished floor level that you're going to stop at um, so it's just a different way to do it but you're going to put up those exterior forms and then you can bring the under the, the plumber in and he can do his under slab plumbing and any conduits that are necessary sometimes he might have to trench if he needs to, to excavate and make room for his plumbing slopes and things like that but he'll come in place all the pipes and then you're going to want to come in and uh, trench beams for the perimeter or interior if you need to go deeper into the soil. And that's going to be done usually around the, usually it's only around the exterior if you need embedment into the soil, um, but sometimes it's interior as well. And then you're going to build up the pads. So the pads are going to define the beams negative shape and in, in all, all the forming. So you're going to bring in engineered fill good base and you're going to build up these pads and layers until you've defined all the shapes of all the concrete beams and where they were supposed to go and you're going to relay out all this stuff kind of as you go so that you can know where your beams are going to be and know where all of your stuff needs to happen um, once those pads are there then you can bring in the other formwork and start kind of putting like the garage step in and any drops that are in the house or some steps here or there and you can start forming the other pieces that are needed and then once that formwork is down, um, you're going to start putting that vapor barrier all over the uh, foundation. You can put the vapor barrier down before the formwork, not a big deal. Just things can move around, but you want that vapor, bar vapor barrier down. And that is a big plastic sheet that is going to keep water from causing problems with your concrete. Concrete is pretty tough, but it is porous. It will absorb water. And when that water gets to steel inside the concrete, the steel can rust. When the steel rusts, it expands. When it expands, it cracks your concrete. So you can have problems. You want to keep the water off your concrete. So you install your vapor barrier. Um, it also keeps some unwanted gases from seeping through the soil, through your concrete, and into your house. You don't want that either. So it's a good thing to have. Once that's down, you're going to put all the steel in. You're going to put the beam steel inside the beam hollow places. You're going to put the slab steel on top of that across the whole slab. Tie everything together, make sure it's all ready to go. You're going to make sure the steel is all raised up off the ground. You don't want any steel in contact with the ground because that causes the same problem. Water is going to rust the steel that's in contact with the ground, and the rust can travel through the entire foundation if it's connected. So don't want that. Once that stuff's in, you're going to want a grounding bar attached to your steel in the slab. For most, most of the time, the electrical system is grounded into the slab steel. 
So they're just going to take a piece of rebar or something, and they're just going to stick it up wherever the electrician is intending to place his panel so that he can run a ground straight down to that and not spend a ton of money traveling far for it. So you want the grounding bar in a good spot. That makes sense. And then if you need to, you're going to have a city or a structural engineer inspect all of this work to make sure that the steel is the right size in the right place. It's the right shape. Yada, yada, yada. You can in inspect the plumbing pipes so that the plumbing pipes come up in the right spots. Very frequently, pipes are missed and they come up in a spot that doesn't work. So you have to bust up the concrete later and then move the pipe and it's a pain in the butt or move the wall. Um, so you don't want to do that. You want to make sure everything's in the right spot because once you pour this concrete, you're either going to have to deal with it or break it. So good time to make sure everything is correct. And then on pour day, when all the pouring is going to happen, there's going to be a bunch of concrete finishers and a bunch of concrete finishing equipment. And they're just going to come and they're going to pour tons of concrete into this thing. And they're going to fill it all up and they're all going to finish it off and make sure it's all pretty. And once it starts to set up a little bit, that's when the anchor bolts for the perimeter of the house are going to be wet set into the concrete so that you have a finished foundation with anchor bolts ready to anchor down the framing. So that's typical slab process. On the right here, we've got a PDF that I had. This is for a particular project that I was bidding a while ago. And I wrote out all these steps uh, to prepare this one particular site for a slab. And I'll just run through here on the screen. You can pause and read it if you want, but this is this is basically it. I mean, I was running through the all of the stuff that was involved, driveway, you know, getting ants out of the way. They had a bunch of sewer pipes and things already in the way of this foundation where it was going to go. So I had to make sure things were out of, out of the way, make sure things were dug up and found so I don't break anything, um, rentals and stuff involved here. So this is just a, me trying to plan out uh, the steps for uh, building this particular foundation. So you can pause this and read these steps if you want. And uh, sort of estimating how many times, uh, how many days it would take me to, to do this thing, depending on my manpower. So, so that is what that was like. Oops, wrong, wrong one. There we go. There's an example there. And then I have a foundation model to show you that is for the uh, garage that I'm trying to potentially build. And I created this model for the, mostly the purposes of, of showing what a slab looks like without you know, having to show you something in person. So this is theoretically going to help you understand what a concrete slab would look like finished with nothing on it. There'd be anchor bolts around the perimeter sticking up, but otherwise this is pretty much what it would look like. Um, it's a, a two-car garage with a one-car spot. The floor is dropped for the car and sloped back towards the door so that water and nasty things can flow out the door. And the other spot is for workshop area. This is what it would look like finished. If I remove the concrete and add, make sure the base and forms are back. This is what it would look like before it's poured. All these boards are the form boards that are going to define the shapes. These are how you would form up these particular things to create the steps and things as you want them. You can see that there's beam channels in here. These, these channels create the beams. In this case, this is built on flat ground. So the, um, the soil that's on top is base for six inches and the rest of it's natural soil below that. So there's uh, not a huge pad. Over here on this side, we have some beam steel just hanging out. This is an example of a beam intersection. You've got corner bars right here that tie the beam steel together. This is a piece of beam steel. These are called stirrups. These U-shaped guys that curve around, drop down to here, go back up and hook again. These tie, these add shear strength to the beams. So the engineer's gonna specify these in the placement. So that's an example of some steel in the works. And if there's no forms and no steel, you can see that the Base pads are dropped on the foundation and sloped on the car side so that the floor is four inches everywhere. And if there's no base, then this is what it looks like after you just trenched everything. You trenched out your perimeter, trenched out your interior beams. And that's that. Right there. 
So that's the model. So if you'd like to learn more about foundations, there's plenty more information on YouTube and the internet about this kind of stuff, but I've listed out some things here that are good starting places. Uh, you should watch the YouTube video, Concrete Slab Foundation Process and Best Practices by Matt Reisinger. You ought to watch YouTube video, Slab versus Peer and Beam, which is better by Matt Reisinger. Watch YouTube video, Spec House Foundation Choice and More Vlog by Essential Craftsman. Watch YouTube video, Concrete Slab versus Crawl, Crawl Space by Essential Craftsman. Both of those two videos are where he's referring to the Spec House build. He's trying to figure out what kind of foundation he wants to use for his property. And of course, watch the YouTube Spec House series, episodes 26 to 37 by Essential Craftsman to see how he actually builds his Crawl Space foundation. Spoiler alert, he selected the Crawl Space versus the Concrete Slab. But that's a great place to see a bunch of practices on how to these foundations together. There's not as much information out there I've seen on the concrete slabs um, and their steps. There is, uh, I believe Texas Barn Dominiums is a is a good one for, for slab work. He does do a decent job showing all the work he does for his, his Barn Dominium slabs. So he's a great resource on that. But um, that said, that is going to end BFB number 13 on foundations. Hope you learned a lot and I'll see you on the next one.